if you ask most people what are the advantages of 64-bit computing uh, compared to 32-bit computing, they'll probably give the answer, well, you can address more than four gigabytes of memory. And while there is actually true in many ways, actually computers, 32-bit computers can actually access more than four gigabytes of memory if necessary. Think about it back in the days of 8-bit computers, they weren't only relying on just 256 bytes of RAM, they could address much more because there are different ways of doing the addressing. Anyway, the actual point is that there are many other advantages to 64-bit computing other than just this magical four gigabytes of memory. So one of the things I want to look at today is are 64-bit apps faster than 32-bit apps? And to do that, we're also going to be looking at the 64-bit version of Ubuntu for the Raspberry Pi 4. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. So I got thinking about this because the recent release of Ubuntu 19.10 actually supports 64-bit Ubuntu on the Raspberry Pi 4. Now the Raspberry Pi 4 has a 64-bit processor in it, but actually Raspbian, which is the default uh, Linux distribution for all Raspberry Pi boards, actually is a 32-bit operating system and it runs 32-bit apps and programs. And the reason for that, of course, is because you then get compatibility from the Raspberry Pi Zero through the 1234 and they can all run the same software with a lot of compatibility because they're all running in this 32-bit version. Now they could produce a 64-bit version which would run on some boards and then a 32-bit version, but to make things simple, they give you a 32-bit version. However, Ubuntu actually now has a 64-bit version of Linux for the Raspberry Pi 4 and for the Raspberry Pi 3. So the first thing I want to do is just show you how you can actually put Ubuntu onto a Raspberry Pi 4. So the first thing you need to do is to download the image file from Ubuntu's website. You then need to write that image file onto a micro SD card, and then you need to put that micro SD card into your Raspberry Pi, and then boot it up obviously with a monitor and keyboard and mouse connected to it. And when you do that, you actually get a full working version of Ubuntu, but just on the command line. Okay, now that the board has booted up, I have used Secure Shell to connect to it. It's enabled by default. And so you log in using that uh, username and password that you set on the initial uh, login there. And so let's just check a few things. First of all, this is um, Ubuntu 19.10 that I'm running there. And also we can check that this is in fact a Raspberry Pi 4 that I'm running. More slash proc slash dev tree slash model that we can see Raspberry Pi uh, for model B rev 1.1 and then just to check it's 64 bit if we actually use the file command that is a way of telling you what a file is so we can use file on user slash bin and then in any binary in there let's say user slash bin slash yes and here we can see very clear that it says it is a 64 bit binary now let's run that same test on a raspberry pi 3 which of course also has a 64-bit processor, but it's running Raspbian, which is the standard distribution from, um, from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, and see what we get there. Okay, so here I am on a Raspberry Pi 3. Let's just check the model number. There we go, Raspberry Pi 3 Model B. Now, the thing, of course, is this is also running a 64-bit processor, but if we do a file on, uh, uh, again, something in the bin directory, we will see that, in fact, it is 32-bit. So although uh, Raspbian is uh, running 32-bit, and it runs Raspbian 32-bit across all the different versions of the Pi, including the Pi 0 right up to the Pi 4. That's why running Ubuntu on the Pi 4 has advantage that you're actually running a 64-bit version of uh, Linux. Okay, I'm back on the Raspberry Pi 4. So the first thing we're gonna do is install a desktop because this is the server version that you get by default. I need to install a desktop and they give you instructions on how to do that. You have a choice between the F XFCE desktop and of course a KDE desktop. So I'm just gonna go with uh, Xubuntu, which is the XFCE, much more lightweight desktop. So we'll just use that now to get that installed and then that will boot up a desktop, which we will look at uh, on the main monitor in a moment. Okay, so that has now finished downloading and I have rebooted and here we see the login screen. We are able to log in with our username and password. And here we are on the desktop. I won't spend too much time giving a desktop tour here. This is an uh, XFCE desktop. And of course we can just quickly run a terminal. And now that's come up, we can just quickly run something inside, let's say HTOP, 
and let's see how that goes. Now I won't spend any more time going through the desktop, but here we are with Ubuntu 64-bit with a desktop running on a Raspberry Pi. So that is really, really interesting. Okay, now that we have a 64-bit version of Ubuntu running on a Raspberry Pi 4, let's consider this question about performance between a 64-bit and a 32-bit computer. Okay, so here we are back uh, at the command line. I want to look at this question. Is a 64-bit version of an OS or of a program faster than the 32-bit version? So to do that, what I've done is I've got my thread test tool program. Uh, which we will, uh, there'll be links to it in the description below. I've used this on many other of my other videos. It basically finds prime numbers. And what I've done is I've compiled it on a Raspberry Pi uh, 3. So you can see here it is a 32-bit version. And I've also compiled a 64-bit version here on uh, the, uh, the Ubuntu uh, version on Raspberry Pi 4 and it is a 64-bit version. So exactly the same source code using uh, the GCC compilers to produce two versions of the same program. So what we're going to do is we're going to run it. So let's see how long it takes to run the 32-bit version of the thread test tool. We'll just create one thread for this uh, test at the moment and we'll do this with um, how many should we do? Five million. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, let's hit that and see what happens. This should, of course, take a few seconds. Not, it won't be uh, hours, but it will just be a few seconds. So this is the 32-bit version running statically linked on a Raspberry Pi 3 and then copied over here onto my Raspberry Pi 4. So this is 32-bit only code. And there we have it. That took 21.8 seconds to run. Okay, so now place your bets. What do you think? If I run the 64-bit version, exactly the same code, but this time compiled here on the Raspberry Pi 4 under Ubuntu, what do you think is gonna be? Well, let's run it and let's see. So again, this is the 64-bit, 1.9 seconds. So a absolutely huge uh, difference there between the two, 21.8 seconds and 1.9 seconds. So that just shows you that there are differences between a 32-bit and a 64-bit version. So I'll just leave it there. I've also found another program on GitHub to calculate primes using a sieve. In fact, this is using a segmented sieve so that it can actually deal with the memory handling a bit better. And again, I've got, uh, there'll be links to it in the description below. Again, I've got here a 32-bit version that I've compiled and now I've also got a 64-bit version here. So again, let's uh, run that. So what we, now I'm deliberately gonna run this one. Now, this is interesting. If we just run segmented 32. Now what I'm gonna do is add, now count the zeros here. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, so there's nine zeros. And the reason I'm doing that is because that number is bigger than what you get in a 32-bit integer. You need a 64-bit integer to be able to do that. And let's see how long that takes to run here on the Raspberry Pi 4. Again, this is the 32-bit version compiled on a Raspberry Pi 3 under Raspbian, which is a 32-bit version of the uh, operating system. And then I've copied it over here onto my Raspberry Pi 4 while it's running now. Okay, and there we have it, 24.7 seconds to run that for five and nine zeros. I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that. What would that be around about 5,000 million or something like that? Okay, so now let's run exactly the same program. We'll just change this to the 64-bit version and see how much quicker or even slower it runs here on the Raspberry Pi 4. Okay, and there we have it, 18.2 seconds. So that's roughly a 25% speed increase. So again, we've seen that the 64-bit version runs a lot quicker than the 32-bit version. Okay, why is that? Let's talk a little bit about why that is. So the question is, why is the 64-bit version faster? Well, really, there are three reasons. The first reason, of course, is that, for example, that program, the segmented sieve program, that actually is written to use 64-bit numbers. So the C code actually says, make this a 64-bit number, make that a 64-bit number. And of course, in a 64-bit computer, whenever it's dealing with a 64-bit number, it can do it all in one go. Bosh, 64 bits, thank you very much. But when you're in a 32-bit computer, there has to be some clever stuff going on that when you want to manipulate that 64-bit number, you have to say, give me one half of it into this 32-bit number, 
let's do our stuff. Now give me the other half, please, into a 32-bit number, and let's do our stuff. And then combined, they are now this 64-bit number. So of course, that can take effectively twice as long because you have to deal with the upper half and the lower half of the 32-bit number, of the 64-bit number as 32-bit numbers. And of course, that can decrease performance. The second reason is that most 64-bit computers, including on Intel, including uh, the ARM chips, have way more registers when you move over to 64-bit. And why that's important is because when the program is running things internally, it doesn't have to write out temporary data variables, loop counters, the numbers it's working on at the moment, it doesn't have to write them out to the main memory. It can keep them in a register, and the register, of course, is running at the same speed as the CPU. It doesn't have to go out through the bus, wait for the memory to kind of recycle and write it and then wait for it to, there's a hot, you know, in computing terms, as far as the CPU comes in, main memory is like, whoa, that's so slow, because really the real performance is going on right in the middle of the chip. And when you've got more registers, you can keep all the data close into the middle of the chip. And the third reason is that actually most uh, modern processors, of course, favor 64-bit over 32-bit. So when there's some design going on in the actual architecture, design decisions are made to optimize the 64-bit path through the processor. That's including the fetching phase and the decoding phase and the execution phase. Everything that the CPU needs to do is optimized for 64-bit. Now the 32-bit will have the advantage of all that optimizations for the, that's happened for the 64-bit will happen for the 32-bit, but there are moments where actually oh, it's a 32-bit thing, well, that's going to take a little bit longer because we can't use the same optimization. Oh, we're going to have to drop something. We're doing, you know, there are, there are not so many optimizations going on. And in fact, almost 32-bit becomes kind of a second-class citizen. It's there for compatibility. It's there as best they can get it. But they have to choose between optimizing something in the hardware for 64-bit or optimizing it in the hardware for 32-bit. They're going to go for 64-bit. So actually, the microarchitecture favors 64-bit even though it's perfectly capable of running 32-bit, perfectly able to do it and even do it quite quickly, the 64-bit path, the 64-bit circuitry is always going to be better in a modern day processor. Okay, so there you have it. I really hope you enjoyed that video as much as I did when I was putting it together. If you did, please do consider giving it a thumbs up. You could also consider hanging around to see what other videos I'm going to release and you could do that by hitting that subscribe button. Go oh, I dare you, hit that subscribe button. In fact, also, while I'm talking about subscribing, I'm releasing very shortly a newsletter, a Gary Explains newsletter. So if you want to be part of that, go over to GaryExplains.com, type in your email address into the description box there to start being one of the first on my newsletter. Okay, I suppose that's about it. I'll see you in the next one.